This is Most Street Radio from PRX. I'm your host, Christopher Kimball. Stanley Tucci is known for bridging food and film. He played Julia Child's husband, Paul, in Julie and Julia, and also directed and starred in Big Night, which follows two brothers trying to save their Italian restaurant. His latest venture is a food travel show set in Italy. Today, he tells us about his gustatory adventures on and off the screen and why Italians don't do takeout. They don't do that. They cook or they go out. Like, oh, I'll order that pasta in. You don't do that. By the time the pasta gets to you, it's gross. You know, Italians are very much about respecting the process of cooking and respecting that it needs to be eaten like when it's cooked. Also coming up, we whip up olive oil yogurt flatbreads from Crete, and Grant Barrett and Martha Barnett reveal the origin of the couch potato. But first, it's my interview with anthropologist Dr. Jennifer Matthews about the ancient history of chewing gum. Jennifer, welcome to Milk Street. Thank you so much for having me. Chicle, the chewing gum of the Americas. Uh, What is chicle? So chicle is a natural latex that comes from what's known as the chico zapote tree. And it is a defensive mechanism of the tree so that if the tree is attacked by insects or, for example, when chicleros, the, the collectors of the chicle, um, would cut into it with a machete, it produces this latex as a kind of protection factor. And that is the ingredient that people have used to chew on for thousands of years. And it is what made chewing gum uh, in the late 19th century and into the mid 20th century. Yeah, it's really interesting. I mean, I never, I kind of knew it was derived from a natural substance, but a natural substance that had been used for millennia by by people who were well aware of its benefits long before we figured it out, right? Exactly. I mean, we know that the ancient Aztecs use it, the ancient Maya used it. They used it for things like cleaning their teeth, for freshening their breath. Uh, they used it to fill in their teeth when they had cavities. So this is something that they recognized it had usefulness way before any of us did. Now, you mention in your book that the Aztecs also had social connotations around chicle. Yeah, sure. And again, we have to take this with a grain of salt. This is uh, the way in which the Spanish talk about the Aztecs. So we have to recognize that it's through that lens. But, you know, the Aztecs did have a lot of social rules about who could do what. And with chewing gum, it was only allowed for very old women and very young children to chew chicle in public. Hmm. If you were a man chewing it in public, you were considered to be homosexual. If you were a female chewing it in public, you were considered a prostitute. It was actually a marker of prostitution. And they talked about prostitutes walking down on the marketplace, uh, clacking their gum like castanets. (laughs) So was the original gum that was chewed, let's say, by the Aztecs, just pure chicle? And what would that be like? And Or did they flavor it or do something to it? There was no flavor to it, and it's just kind of a gray, rubbery substance. I've actually chewed it straight off of the tree, uh, and th- it really does taste kind of rubbery, um, but it's very satisfying to chew it. So chicle comes from Mexico to the U.S. I guess there was a guy called Lopez who wanted to develop chicle as an alternative to rubber, right? Is that right? Correct. Yeah, it was the former president of Mexico, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana. And he had been president 11 different times. Um, He's, of course, probably best known in the U.S. for his role in the Battle of the Alamo, but was, uh, you know, a rather notorious historical figure within Mexico and the Americas. And he had lived his life in exile on many different occasions. And towards the end of his life, he ends up in Staten Island. (laughs) And he is trying to figure out a way to get himself back into power. And so it was not long after rubber had been vulcanized by Goodyear. And he was trying to find the next rubber. Uh, And he had chewed chicle as a kid in Veracruz. And he was looking for an inventor in the United States who could try to create something out of it like rubber. And he ends up meeting a guy by the name of Thomas Adams, who was uh, an amateur inventor. 
And Adams and his sons spend about a year trying to create rubber out of this. And it's just not the right consistency. It won't vulcanize the way that rubber does. And so Lopez de Santa Ana returns to Mexico penniless and dies a pauper. And in the meantime, the Adams family are going crazy because they've spent thousands of dollars of their own money trying to create this next great invention. And the father, Thomas Adams, happens to go into a confectionery store, and he hears a little girl asking for paraffin wax gum. And it suddenly dawns on him, well, if you could use paraffin wax, surely you could use chicle. And so he runs home and he tells his son, we're going to make chewing gum out of this. And they make these really kind of gray, unappealing looking balls (laughs) with no flavor um, and uh, take them back to the the confectionery store. And they sold out immediately. And they realized we have something here. And the rest is history. They end up becoming uh, one of the great chewing gum kings in the late 19th century. So these original gums weren't sweet and then eventually chiclets were invented by the Fleer brothers but that was the first time they actually put a sweet candy coating around the gum is that correct right? they they borrowed the idea from Jordan almonds uh, and then oh. I part of the concept was that this would actually allow them to keep the gum longer store it longer because it would have the protective coating on it and mm-hmm. uh, that became a huge hit um, because it did have a sweeter flavor then by the early 50s, this all changes, right? Because now synthetic alternatives to the the organic, the real thing, uh, are invented, right? Correct, because chewing gum becomes so popular that they can't produce enough chicle. And so the Wrigley company decides that they're going to look for alternatives that will work, and so they start to produce synthetics. So how soon does the natural market collapse? I think you said by the 80s, 1980s, it was completely gone. Yeah, it starts to decline in the 60s and 70s, and and really by the 80s, other than a very small amount of collecting, um, it's completely collapsed. So given what's going on now in terms of organics, farm to table, you know, fair trade, is there any kind of rejuvenation of, of this trade where people want a natural chewing gum, not a synthetic one? Absolutely. And there's a number of small companies that are doing boutique chewing gum with chicle-based gum. Uh, for example, Glee Gum out of uh, Rhode Island is um, one that, that you can find in most places. Natural Markets, Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, etc. often carries it. Uh, I've become a big fan of the natural-based chewing gum, and I really appreciate it because I recognize that this is what my grandma would have been chewing, for example. Jennifer, thank you. Now I uh, want to go and get some bubble gum. <laughs> Thanks for joining me. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. That was Dr. Jennifer Matthews. Her book is Chicle, the Chewing Gum of the Americas, from the Ancient Maya to William Wrigley. Now it's time for my co-host, Sarah Moulton, and I to answer some of your cooking questions. Sarah is the author of Home Cooking 101, also star of Sarah's Weeknight Meals on public television. Okay, Sarah, let's open up the phone lines. I'm ready. Welcome to Milk Street. Who's calling? Hi, uh, my name is Megan, and I'm from Houston, Texas. Hi, Megan. How can we help you today? Well, um, I cook for what I consider to be an average-sized family of five. And that does include two teenage boys. But frequently, when I look for new recipes, they all state that they feed four. So I'm always having to double the recipe. So do you have any tips or rule of thumb for how to double effectively and how to know if a recipe will double well? I think most recipes double pretty well, not baking recipes, savory recipes. No. If there are ingredients in there that, you know, like chilies you might want to sort of cut back a little bit on that just to make sure that you're not killing the family with too much heat. Mostly you can double. Chris, what is your opinion about that? Well, I mean, there are two ways of thinking about this. One is which recipes double well, and the other way to look at it is which recipes are good to be made in bulk, right, for reuse. So, I mean, when I cook, I always double my batch of rice. I double my batch of beans. I double my batch of grains because all those things can be easily repurposed. And freeze well. If I roast a chicken, I roast two chickens, not one chicken, or grill two chickens instead of one. 
taco fillings, for example, are a great way to use leftovers. And so if I'm going to cook beef or pork for that, I'll do like five pounds instead of two or three pounds, right? Because it's right. not much more time in an Instant Pot or however you're going to cook it. Big protein, rice, grains, beans, those are all things which are easily repurposed and easily cooked in double or triple amounts. And you can just use them any way you want. At least you have basic foods that can be seasoned differently with different sauces or accompaniments. So you don't have to eat the same thing twice. It's one way to think about cooking a lot of things at one time. Well, with an Instapot, do you think you have to adjust your cooking time when cooking larger batches? Like I have a 12-quart Instapot. When I attack a recipe, I tend to add a couple of minutes. Do you think that's the right choice? Yeah, if you're going to do five pounds of chicken parts instead of two pounds, normally it might be 20 minutes, right, in the Instant Pot or something like that. You're going to have to increase that time probably to 30 minutes. Yeah, well, I'm just trying to figure out. I get bored with the same recipe. Oh, don't we all? Chili is feed crowds, but you get sick of that. You want to try something new. Well, if you beefed up your pantry, just sort of the Milk Street thing, which is you have some different spices, you have you know, pomegranate molasses, you have gochujang, you have chili sauce, you have these other things, oyster sauce. That's really the way to take a basic ingredient in about two seconds, change the flavor profile. Mm -hmm. So if you think of it that way, you can do a stir fry and just add different spices. You can do whatever. And get some of those, the rest of your family to start cooking. Why don't you have a couple nights where you're off duty and let them do some of the work? I'm trying to get there. I'm trying to get there with my children. So we'll Just go on strike. Goes, just go on strike. That's when, they, that's when they come home with a bucket of KFC. Yeah. 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 So, oh, dear. Anyway, thank you very much We're for calling. We're for you, Hopefully Megan. We really are. Okay. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Take care. Bye. 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 You know, cooking dinner every night will really kill it for you. You know, just having to get dinner on the table, you know, after you've worked a long day is just, it's a shame. Well, I think it's interesting that, quote unquote, in the old days, leftovers, I mean, were critical to all of this, right? I mean, nobody threw anything out. And today it's like almost every night you have to... Reinvent the wheel. Yeah, and that's insane. Yeah. I mean, that's just as, who can do that seven nights a week? No. Yeah, it's crazy. No, I agree. All right, moving on. Welcome to Milk Street. Who's calling? Hi, my name's Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Where are you calling from? Columbus, Ohio. What is your question? All right. So about 10 years ago, I had this amazing, quote unquote, cookie. It was more like a truffle. And I have never been able to find a recipe or a cookie that does it any justice. So I was hoping you guys could solve the mystery for me. Can you give me a few more details? Who gave it to you? What was the texture? A boss of mine brought it in, and his neighbor made it. She moved away that very day. I know she was from Israel. It was a very melt-in-your-mouth kind of chocolate truffle. It had some kind of boozy cherry in it. There was some coconut. It had a bit of like a almost a graham cracker crumble inside. Really interesting. And it was uh, kind of like dusted in cocoa powder all over. Huh. Uh, Well, that sounds like there is an Israeli cookie that is actually not a cookie. If it's not baked, you take um, a basic butter cookie and you grind it up and then you combine it with melted butter and cocoa and sugar and dairy and some sort of flavoring. It could be boozy. It could be like, it sounds like maybe that you had some cherry liqueur in yours. And then you roll it into balls. Oh. Was it round or was it flattened? It was like a truffle, you said. Kind of in between, yeah. Uh-huh. And then you roll it into, it could be chopped candy. It could be, you said cocoa was on the outside of it too? Mm-hmm. Or it could be like crushed chocolate candy or caramel. Does that sound like what it might have been? It could have been, yeah. It definitely had all the facets that you described. Does it have a name? Yeah, I can't pronounce it. (laughs) It's something like a Dury Chocolade. Okay. Does that ring any bells? It does not. I've not come across that, so I will check that out. It would be a fun thing to say to do with kids, little kids, because you you make the mixture, you don't use the oven. You have to melt the butter, but you could even do that in the microwave. Right. Easy to mix and roll and then customize. But at any rate, Chris, do you have any thoughts about this? I've never heard of this and I've never made it. The thing I like about it is the combination of 
the dairy, the ground up biscuit, you know, which is kind of cool, the melted butter, the coconut. It's really, really an interesting combination. I think we need to go into the kitchen and make these immediately. Right. Oh, yes. That would Thanks be great. Thanks for mentioning it. Yeah. This is a new one on me. Well, that's awesome. Great. Catherine, thank you. Thank you Pleasure. so much. Thank you so okay. much. All right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This is Most Street Radio. Looking for culinary inspiration? Well, just give us a ring anytime. Our number is 855-426-9843. One more time, 855-426-9843, or simply email us at questions at MilkStreetRadio.com. Welcome to Milk Street. Who's calling? Uh, This is Brian from New York. Hi, Brian. How can we help you today? I was shopping for fish last week at my local Whole Foods, and I was looking at their large display of ostensibly fresh fish that's laid out over ice. And then next to it, I noticed a freezer full of frozen fish and frozen seafood. And um, I remember hearing some statistic years ago that something like 90-something percent of the fish that you see in a retail environment is actually frozen at some point prior to arriving and then defrosted and presented as fresh. And I was just thinking, like, does it make sense to buy fresh fish or is the frozen... Is it better to buy frozen fish? I, I don't know. Well, you, you bring up a very important point. A lot of fish is actually flash frozen at sea. And in that sense, you know, then it's pretty darn fresh because it's flash frozen right away. But you don't really know is the problem. And 85% of all fish that we get has been imported, so it probably has been frozen. Certainly with the fresh, you can smell it and look at it. It shouldn't really smell like anything. I don't know. I'm sure Chris has an opinion here. I'm brimming with opinions. I know. I can see. Never (laughs) buy your fish at a supermarket, please. I've never had a good experience with that. I think that's dicey. Two, the only test that makes any difference, I think, forget about the smell because they can spray it with stuff. And yeah, you can look and see if, you know, if the fish sitting in a pool of water, that's not a good thing to see. Should be on ice. Yeah. You need to, (laughs) if you can, stick your index finger into it and see what happens the fish bounces back, you know, like a layer cake that's perfectly baked, fine. But if there's a depression there, that means it's not fresh. And that's the only test I think that really is helpful. I don't think all supermarkets are the same. I mean, there's some other very high-end good supermarkets. Yeah. If you go to Whole Foods and you have a good experience with the fish, fine. Let me just ask, you've had good experience at Whole Foods? Yeah. I mean, absolutely. I I think their fish is really good quality. All right indicate sort of where it comes from and stuff like that. Yep. Well, okay. Well, I just want to point out Sarah just stuck her tongue out at me, so I, I just... <laughs> Radio's not a visual medium, so Brian, I Brian, thank you. Out. You yes, just gave you. me one. Okay, thank you. Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Bye. Thank you both. Bye. Bye. You're listening to Milk Street Radio. Up next, I'm chatting with Stanley Tucci. That's right up after the break. But first, let me tell you about this week's sponsor, Crunch Labs. Crunch Labs offers a STEM monthly subscription. It's a build box for kids, which they put together by watching a video of a former NASA engineer turned YouTuber, Mark Rober. Crunch Labs teaches kids to think like engineers, and 80% of kids who tried the build box say they gained a new passion around STEM and engineering while rating it an 8.5 out of 10 on the fun scale. The first 12 build boxes include a disc launcher, a coin spinner, a drawing machine, a strobe light, and a boomerang car. Each month, subscribers get a gear badge, collect all 12, and you'll create a gear train to show off your accomplishments. Plus, one lucky engineer will open their box to find a platinum ticket, which is an invitation to the studio to hang out with Mark and friends in their Willy Wonka-style studio. Go to crunchlabs.com slash milkstreet and get your kids Crunch Labs today. One more time, crunchlabs.com slash milkstreet to get your kids Crunch Labs today. This is Milk Street Radio. I'm your host, Christopher Kimball. Risotto costs us a lot. And... It takes you a long time to make. I mean, you have to work so hard to make, you know? And then we have to charge more. So I think take it away. Maybe 
instead, uh, we could put... Yes, tell me, tell me. Well, uh, I was thinking, um, what do they call it? You know, is a... Come to DJ. Manicotti? No. Is a... Hot dog? Hot dog? Hot dog? Yeah, hot dogs. I think people would like that. That was a clip from the movie Big Night. Stanley Tucci's character, Segundo, is trying to cut down on costs at his failing restaurant, while his brother Primo wants to maintain the integrity of their authentic menu. In his new memoir, Taste, Tucci reveals he was inspired to write the movie to show how food is often used to express emotion. Stanley, welcome to uh, Milk Street. Thank you. Thanks for having me. In Big Night, one of my favorite movies, the last scene, which is now iconic, uh, your character is making eggs in the morning for his brother and also the busboy in the restaurant. So the big dinner did not go as planned, and there's a lot of tension in the room. So here's this scene. It's five minutes long, and it's almost completely silent. I I just watched it again yesterday. Tears came to my eyes, and I think because you perfectly represented why I love cooking and why I got into this business. But since you co-wrote the film and starred in it, maybe you could talk about that scene from a food point of view and what it means to you? Um, yeah, so when we wrote this scene, it was a sort of test in a way to see if if you've come to know characters well throughout a film, we should be able at the end to know them so well that we don't even have to hear them talk. To tell a story, you can tell a story a thousand ways. You can tell it with words, you can tell it with movement, you can tell it with a look. And that is sort of the beauty of of cinema, is that, you know, those images tell us so much. And the space around people and the way people move through a space is as important as, as the words. On the other hand, since I'm a food guy, I'm watching you make this thing. And I'm going like, gee, that looks like a burner's really on high, and it's an aluminum pan. Those eggs are going to stick. So when you flipped it, which, by the way, was masterful, <laughs> um, how come the eggs didn't stick? The first pan I used wasn't working, and it was sticking, and I was panicked. You know, because you could it was a period film, right? So you couldn't have a non-stick pan or something. So right. um, I f- just happened to grab that pan and give it a try, and it worked. There was quite a bit of oil in there. But also, the hotter that is, the less it's going to stick. See, I I watch Big Night, I learn how to cook. Okay. (laughs) So you grew up in upstate New York in Katona, but both of your parents had families that had deep roots in southern Italy and Calabria. Yes, 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 exactly. So I think it was your grandmother, Concetta, who came over when she was three years old. And you write about her sub-basement kitchen uh, in your book. Yeah, it was really, yeah, it was great. It was just, you know, it was just this great basement where there was a workshop and there was a stove down there. And that's where my grandfather made wine and that's where they stored, you know, whatever they canned or bottled that year. And that's where she did a lot of extra cooking. From what I can tell from your book, uh, you absolutely have strong opinions about Italian food. <laughs> so, so let's talk about garlic. So, like, I've been on this crusade. You, you can tell how exciting my life is. This is my crusade. I, I'm just totally <laughs> against mincing, you know, or mashing garlic. Like, you slice it, you maybe smash a clove, put in the olive oil, take it out. Absolutely. Like they do in yeah, Italy. On cer- in certain dishes, you can do that. Yeah. Like in our, in our ragu, it's one of the only times that really calls for sort of like a minced garlic. Or if we make um, a breadcrumb mixture with parsley, right. a little bit of garlic, and you're going to put that over a, over like a bluefish or in, in mushrooms. There you do it. But you have, to, you have to make sure that it isn't too much. Right. Um, it has to be the right amount. Otherwise, and this is a line at the very beginning of Big Night where the brother's chopping garlic. Not too fine, eh? But sometimes you cut it too fine, then all you taste is the garlic. And, and you're you're a big fan of getting combinations right. Like you, you you're, you're keen on which pasta shape to use with a ragu, for example. I think I think your quote in the book was, "The combination of star pasta and me ragu is heresy." Yeah, I think it's respectful to tradition, and also those rules are there because things taste better that way. <laughs> right. And then you would say, 
Never put a meatball in a pasta bowl? Yes, that was the way I was brought up. You just didn't do it. You ate the sauce with the pasta, and then you had the meatballs separately. So that's also in the first scene of Big Night, right? Yes. Your character is waiting on diners that don't understand why the spaghetti and the meatballs come separately. Order a side of spaghetti, that's all. Uh, and I'll eat your meatballs. Yeah, he'll have the meatballs. Well, um, the spaghetti comes without meatballs. There are no meatballs with the spaghetti? No, sometimes spaghetti likes to be alone. <laughs> <laughs> so, with your new show, Searching for Italy, was there something new or different you wanted to explain or show about Italian cooking? I wanted it to really, first of all, to separate Italy region by region. Now, that has been done, but on a smaller scale. And I wanted to make sure that we were telling stories that were historical, that addressed uh, contemporary social and political issues. But everything was done through the prism of food. Uh, in, in order to, to show, the, as much as you can, what's the genesis of that cuisine in any given region, and where is it now, and what's it connected to? Going back to the movie world for a moment, in, in Julie and Julia, uh, you play Paul Child. I, I knew him a little bit in his later years. He Uh-oh. was a very, very quiet guy uh, by that time, because Julie obviously was such a superstar. And, yeah. But, but I gather based upon reading a little bit about him and, and your role, he was quite an impressive person in his own right. Yeah, he was quite interesting. I mean, he was, he was, a, he was kind of a Renaissance man. Uh, he was a photographer. He was a painter. He was an expert in, in judo. He was a cultural and diplomatic liaison. He was a real gourmand. And, you know, that was probably maybe like the most perfect marriage ever. <laughs> So there we were in China, just friends, having dinner. And and it turned out to be Julia. It turned out to be Julia all along. Julia, you are the butter to my bread and the breath to my life. I love you, darling girl. Before you started production, you called Meryl and said, Let's, we need to cook together. Was that just for fun, or you thought that was helpful training for the movie? It was just helpful. I mean, I think just doing some activity that is akin to what you're going to be doing in the film or whatever it is, it can be very helpful. Uh, and she agreed, and we cooked from Julia Child's cookbook. Mastering the Art of French Cooking. And we um, cooked planquette de veau. Meryl made a tart tatin. And I tried to make some sort of, I don't know, some artichoke thing, but I kind of messed it up. It wasn't very good. <laughs> um, so I think it was at a lunch uh, while you were doing a press tour in France, dining with Meryl Streep, and you all decided to order the andouillette sausage, right? Yep. Could you just talk about that, and why that did not work out so well? Well, it didn't work out because it's disgusting. And, <laughs> I mean, I don't know if you've ever had Have you ever had it? Nope, never had it. Okay, well, don't. And I know there are people who are probably listening to this going, he's a Philistine, you know, um, but I'm sorry. So it's called Andouillette, and it's, it's this huge sausage that is stuffed with entrails. So it's entrails wrapped around entrails, including even the colon. So that's gross. <laughs> and uh, to us, it was horrifying. <laughs> uh, because we both thought, and we said it out loud, we both thought, oh, andouillette. Well, I love andouille sausages, so this must be like a small version of right, them. Right. And then later, when we weren't eating it, and the owner came over and said, how is everything, you know? And we went, oh, well, you know, it's, it's, lo- it's lovely. It's really, it's really good. It's just, it's just not what we expected or, you know, as I wrote in the book, you know, it's just a little different from others we've had, which is completely, well, it's all lies, you know. And, <laughs> and he goes, yes, um, would you like something else? <laughs> <laughs> you said, which surprised me, that the, uh, the lunches on, if you're doing a, a movie in Italy, 
were just as bad as they are in the states, or maybe not that bad, but pretty close. <laughs> so I, I was I was shocked. Yeah. I, I thought in Italy you would actually get decent food on set. No, no, not really. No, because mostly everybody goes out to eat. You know, Italians don't do takeout. <laughs> do you know what I mean? That's a good point. They don't do that. They cook or they go out. Like, oh, I'll order that pasta in. You don't do that. By the time the pasta gets to you, it's gross. You know, Italians are very much about respecting the process of cooking and respecting that it needs to be eaten, like, when it's cooked. A lot of things about making a movie are not very appealing, right? The, the, the bad food in the trailer, the hours, being away from home, etc. So mm. you love acting, right? What's what's the love part of it that that just makes it so appealing? You wouldn't want to do anything else. It's fun when you're actually doing it. It's really fun when you're acting with somebody that you admire, or, you know, meeting somebody new, and you're working with a wonderful director, and meeting a great crew. There's this wonderful sort of conviviality, and and it's quite exciting. You quoted Rilke in Letters to a Young Poet. You you said that. He gives advice to a soldier who aspires to be a poet. And Rilke's advice is, paraphrasing, only if he feels that he would die were he unable to write should he be a poet. Does that obviously have some resonance in terms of what's important to you? Yeah, because I I felt that as an actor. And I, I, I really, when I was younger, I really felt like if I couldn't do this anymore, I would cease to exist. And, um... I still feel that to, to a certain extent, but food has taken over a big part of my life. And I, there is no question that were I not able to eat, were I not able to cook and spend time with people, you know, through food, that I, would, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want to be around necessarily. Stanley, it's been uh, a pleasure and an honor. Thank you so much uh, for being on Milk Street. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me. It's been really fun. That was Stanley Tucci. His book is Taste, My Life Through Food. You know, food and cinema are often described as art. Tucci deconstructs the famous breakfast scene in Big Night from a filmmaker's point of view, using the diminishing distance between characters to signal a resolution of conflict. And in the kitchen, chefs use compelling combinations of taste and texture to demonstrate how opposites attract. Whether food or cinema, it's more craft than art, more practice than muse, more school of hard knocks than maybe a PhD. Stanley Tucci and Julia Child may have been blessed by the muse, but only after they had really earned it. You're listening to Milk Street Radio. It's time to chat with J.M. Hirsch about this week's recipe, yogurt and olive oil flatbreads. J.M., how are you? I am great. So flatbreads, I mean, there's a million flatbreads out there. Many regions of the world have a whole bunch of different types. This is one you came across in Crete recently, which is actually a little bit different. It uses yogurt and olive oil. Yeah, you know, we've had flatbreads all over the world, as you say, but this one I was really impressed with. You know, I was in Crete working with a chef, Mariana Levitataki, who grew up in Crete. She works in London now, but she was kind of taking me on a tour of all, like, the culinary highs of the island, and this flatbread was absolutely one of them. We're in this kind of mountaintop little village, and we were working with a local chef, and he was showing off all his stews, and Mariana was making her version of souvlaki, which is a pork dish that is just outrageously good. Well, we needed something to sop all that up with and eat it, and so she decided to bang out her yogurt and olive oil flatbreads. And because of that yogurt in it, it created such a tender, moist crumb to the flatbreads, and they came together so easily, I couldn't believe it. So some flatbreads have no leavening, some have chemical leavening, some have yeast. This is a yeasted flatbread? 
It's a yeasted flatbread, but boy, it takes no time at all. You know, she whipped up this dough in a matter of minutes, threw a towel over it, set it aside while we did a bunch of other stuff. And I think like 20 minutes later or so, we came back to it. It was nice and doubled, rolled it out. We cooked it over hot coals outside and gosh, it was so good. So for those of us who don't have the hot coals outside that you could just throw it in a <laughs> cast iron skillet, right? I mean, if you must, yeah. You can do it in a skillet. And then, of course, you know, th- you finish it off with a bit of olive oil and some za'atar. And we like to throw some ground sumac and oregano. The Cretans love their dried oregano. They use it on everything. Throw that on top. And frankly, as much as I loved her souvlaki, I didn't need anything else to go on this bread. I just ate it by itself. I've made her souvlaki. Which she is a deconstructed souvlaki, right? It's uh... Yeah, you know, it, it goes back to when she was a kid and her mom, while taking her shopping, would then take her out for souvlaki. And the souvlaki is served in a flatbread, you know, with all sorts of toppings and stuff on it. Well, it would drive her mother nuts, but she would sit there and deconstruct her souvlaki, <laughs> taking it apart on her plate, you know, and eating just one piece, the salad part and, the, you know, the yogurt part and the meat part and the bread part all on their own. And today, the way she makes souvlaki is in this kind of deconstructed way that she liked as a child. So she doesn't have to take it apart anymore. Jam, thank you. A particularly rich, soft and flavorful flatbreads made with yogurt and olive oil. Thank you. You can get this recipe for yogurt and olive oil flatbreads at MilkStreetRadio.com. This is Milk Street Radio. Coming up, Grant Barrett and Martha Barnett explain the origins of the term couch potato. We'll be right back. I'm Christopher Kimball. You're listening to Milk Street Radio. Right now, Sarah Moult and I will be answering a few more of your cooking questions. Welcome to Milk Street. Who's calling? Hey, this is Mallory from Red Oak, Texas. How can we help you today? My husband likes to end his day with an old fashioned, mm-hmm. and he's kind of always on the hunt for the best recipe. And I know Chris has previously mentioned that he also yeah. likes to enjoy an old fashioned in the evening. And we were just kind of wondering what your favorite recipe is. You came to the right place. First of all, I'm really persnickety about everything, but about this, like it has to be done just right. So here's the recipe. An ounce of bourbon, an ounce and a half of rye. It's really important to mix bourbon and rye. Rye as you know, spicy uh, and it Uh offsets the sweetness. So that's really good. I use a dash of Angostura And then I use a dash of something else, orange bitters. I've actually tried chocolate bitters, which is great, cardamom, just to add another flavor. The other thing is dashes, depends on the bottle. You know, some dashes (laughs) are not the same as others. So you have to kind of Uh figure that out on your own. I take a Boston shaker. I take the small cup. I put one cube of pure cane sugar or demerara sugar in it, not white sugar. I put the dashes of the bitters in that. I add just a splash of water, like no more than a tablespoon, and I muddle it, right? Okay. In the big shaker, um, I use very large ice cubes because if you use the ones that come out of your freezer drawer, they'll just melt too fast. So that's important. Okay. Add the liquor, then put the Boston shaker together. You don't want to shake it too much like you would with a normal drink that you shake. I'd say 10 to 15 shakes. Pop it open and strain it into a double old-fashioned glass. I like to use medium cubes. <laughs> you, now you know okay. how crazy I am. I like to use medium cubes <laughs> in the glass. I don't want it to melt. I mean, I, I watch people drink, and after half an hour, it's just water. I think a cocktail should be consumed fairly quickly, you know, no more than 10 minutes, because after that, things start to go south. The last thing I'll mention is I think it's important to slightly dilute it because over 85% proof you only taste the alcohol. You can't taste the other flavors. A bartender once told me that. So a little bit of dilution is helpful to really experience all the flavors in the drink. And also, I okay. like it really cold. Okay. Don't put in those super sweet, nasty cherries. No fruit, please. No okay. fruit at all. <laughs> okay. A little orange peel, if you like, but don't give me a slice orange. But Chris, I'm intrigued by your size of ice cubes. 
where do you find the ice cube trays for these different sizes of ice cubes? I thought it was one size fits all here. Oh, no, 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 Sarah. There's a jillion choices out there. You can get round ice cubes and big ice cubes. I use two sizes. I use medium size and large size. Large size for the shaking or stirring and the medium size for the glass. What bourbon and rye, is there a specific yes. one that you use? Of or? course there is. <laughs> Uh, High West makes a double rye, which I love. Okay. There's a bunch of bourbons I like. Buffalo Trace is pretty good. There's the mm-hmm. um, the one that comes in that very long, tall neck bottle. It begins with a W. Is it Weller? Yes. Yes, okay. I think that's it. You got more than you bargained for. No, this was awesome. Well, you know, I, we'd like to know if the two of you like, I mean, I hope you like the recipe. Yeah, let Chris know. Let me know. We will let you know. Thank you so okay. much. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. This is Mill Street Radio. If you have a kitchen mystery that needs solving, please give us a ring anytime. 855-426-9843. That's 855-426-9843. Or email us at questions at MilkStreetRadio.com. Welcome to Milk Street. Who's calling? Hi, this is Anthony. I'm calling from Atlanta, Georgia. How can we help you? I am calling because I have a question about flour. I use a flour from Argentina that I can get here locally, and I want to try to find a domestic equivalent to it. And it's been very difficult because there's not a lot of research that I can find to equate them because they're all different grading systems. But it is a 4-0 flour. I thought that that had something to do with the protein content in the flour. And I was told it's just a matter of how refined the flour is, right? So my understanding in Italian terms with zeros is that like a double zero Italian flour is just a highly refined flour. It's very, very sifted. It's very fine. And they use that for pasta making. I kind of discovered that the number of zeros at least the grading system that they're using in Argentina is not really related to that Italian grading system. They're somewhat overlapping in terms of the fineness, I think, like you're saying. But I did discover that it's more like a pastry flour in terms of protein content, like maybe nine-ish, give or take. And then I also found out that um, the flour is probably, from some blogs and forums I read, that it's probably coming out a much lower extraction. So it's the very purest part of the endosperm that, you know, mostly right. starch. So that's kind of where I fell in the market of, you know, pastry flour, but I was wondering if all purpose would have been fine too. And, uh, you know, just couldn't quite make a good match. So what are you using the flour for? Well, my girlfriend, she's from Argentina and she mm-hmm. makes apajores, which are a pastry that are so delicious. The sandwich cookie that's filled with dulce de leche and the, the cookies that she makes are uses that flour. You know what? A King Arthur flour is going to be close to 12%, all-purpose gluten, you know, protein. Gold medal, et cetera, is going to be 10 to 11. It's a little lower. I would think for a cookie, you could get away with just an all, like a gold medal, a Pillsbury flour at 10.5%. It's not like you're trying to do a cake or something, you know, like a southern white cake. I mean, you could buy pastry flour and give that a shot. But I think for a cookie, even a very delicate cookie, I, I think a low-protein, all-purpose flour would be fine. I mean, Sarah, what do you think? Yeah, I sort of agree. I mean, but I was going to ask you, there you are in Georgia. Are you familiar with the white lily flour? Right. That has a lower protein content. Yeah, it might does. even be around 9%. So that, that would that be that a might, good option. Yeah, that's yeah. a good point. We'd be glad to do a taste test. Yeah, oh, well, yeah. We absolutely. We could be your taste testers, yeah. yeah. She mm-hmm. would be happy to send them to you. And I'm happy <laughs> to do the work. I am a food scientist, and I do product development for a bakery company in Atlanta. Oh, you do? So I've got all the tools at my disposal. <laughs> wow. I was going to say, I tried to do as much research as I had available to me in my working space, but I really just wanted to reach out to you guys to get some other perspective because uh, I know you guys have your head space in a lot of different bakery and cooking parts of the world. So, yeah, it's uh, just the, the problem is flowers from different places. You know, it's har- <laughs> hard to know because uh, all the wheats are different. Anyway, uh, send us three cookies, okay? One for yeah, each test. Yeah, please, and Anthony, or, we can't or wait. six. One yeah. for Sarah, one for Sarah. <laughs> yes. All right, take care. It's so good. All right. Thanks, Anthony. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Next up, it's Graham Barrett and Martha Barnett, hosts of Away With Words. Graham, Martha, what's going on this week? 
Chris, this week we have potatoes on our mind. Yep, we're doing the mash. <laughs> you know, what's interesting about the potato is that the potato early on had a bit of an identity problem. You know, it wasn't introduced into Europe until the mid-1500s by Spaniards who'd been traveling in Latin America and the Caribbean. And the Spanish had picked up this word that sounded like patata or batata that originated apparently with the Taino people in what is now Haiti. And the English picked this word up as potato, but they had initially applied the word potato to the tuber that we know as the sweet potato. So mm. it's, it's gone through some different permutations over the centuries. Yeah, and in Spanish, still, there's some differentiation where you might find in some Spanish-speaking countries, depending on the dialect, batata with a B is still often the sweet potato, and papa, or patata, is the other kind of potato. And, of course, there are many varieties. But uh, papa, the P-A-P-A, -A, is actually from Quechua, the language that's still widely spoken in South America. In Portuguese, in Macau, isn't there a, a sweet potato pudding called batata? There may very well be, and I would not be surprised because the words spread throughout the world. You know, when this particular food stuff was first introduced, everybody immediately recognized its value, and the word or some modifications of it tended to travel with it. Although there's a strange thing that happened in Europe, where instead of taking the Spanish word that the Spanish had picked up in the Caribbean, they all decided on some form of earth apple. You would probably know that the French called it the pomme de terre, right. but the French weren't the only one. The Dutch uh, and, of course, Afrikaans. Mm -hmm. So wait, 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 wait. Where did Earth Apple, where did that concept come from? Uh -huh. <laughs> well, Chris, it's a great example of how often in language, if we see something that we've never seen before, we reach for something familiar to name it. Uh -huh. I always like to uh, mention the word porpoise, which comes from the Latin porcus and piscus, which means pig fish, literally. You know, you don't, you don't know what that particular animal is in the water that, that looks sort of like a pig and sort of like a fish. Um, and that's what happened with uh, the... The potato. Huh. Um, the expression pomme de terre in uh, French comes from the Latin pomum, which means fruit, and later it meant specifically apple. And there are even German versions of this Erdapfel, which means earth apple. German did a weird thing. So the Erdapfel that Martha brought up is the old word for it, and it's still in some dialect use. Now, uh, today, in German, they use tartuffel, which strangely comes from the Italian word truffle, T-R-U-F-F-L-E. This is the, the fungi, you know, and that's because they both grow in the ground. And so Danish and Norwegian and Russian and Polish and Romanian and Icelandic all have a form of this word from the Italian word tartufolo, which itself comes from Latin words meaning tuber. Of course, the English speakers in the United Kingdom and in North America had no problem with potatoes, which is why there are slang words and expressions just littered in the language. Things like your potato trap is your mouth and your potato bag is your stomach. And you might say, get your potato grabbers off my food, meaning get your hands off my food. <laughs> in professional wrestling, if you potato someone, it means that you accidentally hurt them. Hmm. Yeah, and then in the internet even, there's potato quality, which you talk about with really bad images, stuff that's shared so much that it's really jaggy and pixelated. Mm. The joke is that the image is so bad, it looks like it was taken with a potato <laughs> instead of a camera. <laughs> <laughs> and Martha, we had just passed uh, a couple of years ago an anniversary of couch potato, right? We did. It's been in the English language for 40 years now. It showed up in print uh, originally in 1978, as far as we can tell, although it's probably, probably older. Yeah. But, of course, it's, it's kind of self-explanatory. You know, you're just sitting on the couch immobile as a potato. That one, I, I, I get that. <laughs> yeah. You got that one. <laughs> I got that one, yeah. You know, we think, Chris, that you're a little bit of a, a big potato yourself. You ever heard anyone called a big potato? <laughs> a big cheese, but not a big potato. Yeah. What, 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 what's the big potato? It's a big cheese, actually. Oh. If you're a big potato, you're no small potatoes. Right. There's a story about uh, a farmer who saved himself the trouble and expense of hand sorting his potatoes by loading them all into a wagon, and then he takes the long, rough road into town. And what happens is the little potatoes, as you can imagine, 
intelligence sift to the bottom and the biggest ones shake out on top. So the expression, when the going is tough, the big potatoes rise to the top, uh, is an illustration of rising to the occasion. And one last thing before we go. You know, we don't have this in the United States, but I think we should. The British and people in Chile and Spain call holes in socks or hose, like pantyhose, a potato. What? You can tener papas en los casetines in Chile. <laughs> you think about a round heel or a knee showing through a hole. It kind of looks like a potato sticking out. That's weird. <laughs> <laughs> You don't have a potato in your socks? No, I, I don't. Uh... Chris, clearly you never wore pantyhose in junior high because oh. I had plenty of potatoes coming out of my stockings. That's true. I did not. I've led a sheltered life. Grant and Martha, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'm going to go fry some earth apples, uh, and I'll let you know how it turns out. Outstanding. Sounds good. You're the big potato, Chris. Thanks for having us on. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Yeah, take care. Bye. That was Grant Barrett and Martha Barnett, hosts of Away With Words. That's it for this week's show. If you tune in too late or want to binge listen every single episode, you can download Milk Street Radio on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. To learn more about Milk Street, please go to 177milkstreet.com. There you can find all of our recipes, take a free online cooking class, and order our latest cookbook, Milk Street Vegetables. You can also find us on Facebook at Christopher Kimball's Milk Street, on Instagram and Twitter at 177milkstreet. We'll be back next week with more food stories, and thanks, as always, for listening. Christopher Kimball's Milk Street Radio is produced by Milk Street in association with GBH. Executive producer, Melissa Baldino. Senior audio editor, Melissa Allison. Producers, Sarah Clapp and Jason Tereski. Production assistant, Amelia McGuire and production help from Debbie Paddock. Additional editing by Sydney Lewis. Audio mixing by Jay Allison at Atlantic Public Media in Woods Hole, Massachusetts. Theme music by Two Bob Crew. Additional music by George Brandel Egloth. Christopher Kimball's Milk Street Radio is distributed by PRX.